For those of you who've been here at the Tabernacle uh, over the years, you know that I have in the past given a series of teachings that is called War Between the Seeds. And today uh, I felt led to give an overview of that series of teachings. And there's a lot of information uh, that I'm going to share with you today. So let's get focused, let's get in the spirit, and as a matter of fact, let's pray. Father, we come before you in Yeshua's name, and Lord, we pray, uh, Lord, that you would send the Holy Spirit to uh, anoint your word and to give us deeper insight and revelation of who you are and of your divine overall plan for all of mankind. Thank you, Father. We pray again. Be glorified in this teaching. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Now, this series of teachings called War Between the Seeds, it actually reveals much of what is happening in the Middle East today, meaning the ongoing conflict between uh, Israel and the Arab nations, between the descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Esau. And I can only give the highlights of uh, this series of teachings today, because originally, again, it was a 12-part series, and you can't obtain that in the Temple Judaica. However, and I felt this was a good timing for this, this overview teaching today does include as a foundation much of the book of Genesis, which we recently entered into in our new Torah cycle, meaning that the timing is good uh, according to the designated Torah portions. Now let me ask you a question. How many of you know that God knows all things before they even happen? Hallelujah. 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 Let me just read to you a couple of scriptures from the prophet Isaiah. You don't have to turn there. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8 and 9. Hashem says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. And Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Now most of us know that there are so many wonderful uh, prophecies, end time prophecies, in the books of the Nevi'i, meaning in the books of the prophets themselves, but I am convinced that some of the greatest end time prophecies and some of the greatest hidden manna of the Bible, how many of you love to discover that hidden manna of God's word, that some of the greatest end time prophecies are actually found in the opening chapters of the Bible itself in the book of Genesis. Because in the book of Genesis, God reveals the end from the beginning. So if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verse 11 and 12. Now please remember, I'm going to move things along fairly quickly. I just pray you'll stay with me. Genesis 1, verse 11 and 12. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit, according to its kind, whose seed is in itself. That's very important, highlight that. According to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed, according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. 
Whatever the seed may be, that is what the fruit will be, and vice versa. Whatever the fruit is, it is merely a reflection of the seed within. Thus we have the statement here, whose seed is within itself. An example of this would be you'll never bite into an apple and find a peach pit inside of it. Well, you'll never bite into a, a pear and find an olive pit inside of it. Because God established the law that seeds should reproduce only according to their own kind. That cannot be changed. Now, this particular law is also the basis for Yeshua's teachings on how to deal with false prophets or false teachers. In Matthew 7, he says, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, nor can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Again, from Matthew chapter 7, verse 16 through 20. So once again, whether a good tree or a corrupt tree, it may only reproduce after its own kind. Again, this is how it's been since the beginning, and this is how it will be in the end. Now, we all know that in the beginning there were two trees in the midst of the garden, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. There was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I believe this actually is where the war between the seeds begins. Because one of these trees meant life, and yet the other resulted in death. And these two trees and the fruit that they bore were spawned by their respective seeds, and I'll elaborate on that in a moment, and their respective seeds were actually at enmity with one another, meaning they were in opposition to each other. So from the beginning, there's always been a mutual antagonism between the two, and furthermore, the righteous seed has always produced and continues to produce righteousness, and the wicked seed continues to produce and propagate corruption. And this also is how it is today. It's still the same, even in these last days. Because again, God reveals the end from the beginning. Now let's take a closer look at the tree of life. What is the good seed that produced the tree of life? Obviously, it's the Word of God. God spoke it into existence. The Word of God is the good seed that spawned the tree of life, which in turn produces good fruit, which leads to eternal life. Now, tree of life, most of us know uh, that in Hebrew, who can tell me how it's pronounced? Tree of Life, we sang it this morning. Eight Chayim. And it means Tree of Life, but it's also a reference to God's Torah. And we chanted every morning on Saturday on Shabbat. We did just a few moments ago. It's from Proverbs 3, verse 17 and 18. And it reads, It is a tree of life to those who take hold of it, and happy are those who support it. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. The it in that phrase is referring to God's word, meaning God's Torah. And it is also compared to the tree of life, Eitz Chaim in Hebrew. Now Yeshua himself confirms that the good seed is the Word of God. He confirms that in the parable of the sower and the seed, which is found in several places in the New Covenant, in Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8. Now furthermore, because Yeshua 
is the Word. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeshua is the Word made flesh. John 1.14 tells us that. Because of that, He is the seed itself. And He's also the one who sows the good seed according to His own words in Matthew 13, verse 37. Now, what about the other tree? The other tree in the midst of the garden. Whose seed produced the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Now, let's get ready to be stretched here because this is going to be different from traditional thinking. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Whose seed produced it? Was it God's seed? Personally, I don't think so. First of all, everything God created in the beginning, he called good. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 12, and again in verse 31. Not good and evil. However, and I will concede this point. Isaiah 45, verse 7 does say, I am the Lord who forms light and creates darkness, who makes peace and creates evil. And so we need to take that into consideration. But I also believe that Matthew chapter 13 is going to give us some deeper insight. And we'll look at that in a minute. So the seed... We know this, that spawned this other tree, meaning the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it spawned fruit that was not good for food. In fact, it, it uh, contained something that was deadly. We also need to remember that Genesis 3, verse 6 tells us it was the woman, Eve, not God, who determined that the fruit was good for food and that it was pleasing to the eye. It was her, and again, not God. Furthermore, if God was actually responsible for this tree, then we are forced to believe that he intentionally planted this tree in a very conspicuous place right in the middle of the garden, knowing that man would see it and be curious about it, meaning that God intentionally tempted him. And as far as I see it, this would not be consistent with the teachings of the New Covenant or the Prihada Shah, because remember that it was Satan, not God, who tempted Yeshua in the wilderness. Now, Yeshua's parable about the wheat and the tares, as I said before, in Matthew 13, gives us deeper insight. And I suggest that you read all of Matthew chapter 13 later and let the Lord reveal things to you. Yeshua says in verse 24 and 25, the kingdom of heaven is like a man. I say man in quotes because Yeshua is uh, uh, making a reference to God in this parable when he says, is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. And then he says, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and then the enemy went his way. So according to the parable of Yeshua in Matthew chapter 13, again, Yeshua who was there in the beginning, the adversary sowed his degenerate seed in God's field, Yeshua says, while men slept, or meaning not at their post. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, when God told Adam to tend and to keep the garden, the Hebrew word used for keep in Genesis 2.15 is shamar. Everyone say shamar. Shamar, which actually means not just to keep, but to guard. G-U-A-R-D, to guard it. And by the way, that's the same Hebrew word shomer that's used in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, which tells us to not only honor the Sabbath, but to, and to remember the Sabbath, but to guard the Sabbath, to protect it. So could it be the, that the phrase that Yeshua uses in Matthew 13, while men slept, is a reference to Adam? Perhaps Adam at some point failed to guard the garden, 
against an adversary. Or perhaps he failed to stop an intruder who wanted to just slither in and corrupt paradise by sowing his bad seed. Now again, I know this challenges traditional thinking, but it's quite possible that Satan and his corrupt seed is responsible for this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Another insight is that Peter, James, and John, if you want to bring this into the New Testament, Peter, James, and John, they fell asleep in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and Satan, in the person of Judas Iscariot, immediately, what did he do? Slithered in and betrayed the Son of God. Now, furthermore, and I think this puts a nice cap on things, in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, it speaks of a restored paradise that also is created by God, and there is not a tree of the knowledge of good and evil in it, but only the tree of life. And that ought to tell us something. Now let's also remember that the serpent was the most cunning of all the beasts of the field, says Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. And we also know that for every miracle of God, Satan has a counterfeit. Amen? Amen? For everything that is genuine of God, Satan has a counterfeit. Now like the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it also produced fruit. So it stands to reason that if the good seed, meaning the one that produced the tree of life, is synonymous with the word of God, then the corrupt seed which produced the tree of knowledge of good and evil is synonymous with the word of the serpent. And make no mistake about it, Satan has his own word. And what has his word been since the beginning? His word has been the mingling or the mixing of the truth with a lie. And that actually is how he deceived Adam and Eve. It's very clear in Genesis chapter 3 verse 4. The serpent said to Eve that to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would not result in death. That was a lie. In the next verse, verse 5, he said that to eat of this fruit would open up her eyes so that she could discern between good and evil, and that part was true. That's his methodology, to mix a measure of truth with lies, but yet it's all a lie in the end. We know also that Satan knows how to misappropriate scripture. Remember when Yeshua was tempted in the wilderness, again by Satan, by God, that the enemy said, throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. Doesn't it say in Psalm 91 that the angels will bear you up? So Satan knows how to misappropriate scripture, to, again, to mix truth with lies. But Yeshua rightly divided the word of truth and rebuked him with the words of Torah. But this is how the enemy deceives many today. Again, mixing a measure of truth with lies. Now, I was thinking about that recently. As I was going over my notes, and I was reminded of something I have seen and heard on the news in the last few days. And that is Bibi, President Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister Benjamin Benjamin Netanyahu, he made a statement that the former president of Iran was clearly a wolf in wolf's clothing, but that the new president of Iran is a wolf in sheep's clothing, meaning that the former president of Iran was a wolf in wolf's clothing, he was filled with all lies, the new president of Iran was a wolf in sheep's clothing, means it's some truth mixed with lies, yet it's all a lie in the end. Now let me ask you, where do you think that comes from? All of that goes back to the beginning. Yeshua has in John chapter 8 verse 44 that Satan is the father of all lies. He's been a liar since the beginning.
Now, as we take this a step further, this also means that any other holy book, if you will, that ignores or distorts or defies or disputes the infallible word of God is the word of Satan. And it comes from a degenerate seed, again, which mixes or mingles lies with truth. Now, such is the case with the Quran. Do you know that the Quran has its own Torah? And it does emphasize rewards for good works, but it denies the need for blood redemption for the forgiveness of sins. Big difference. And those who receive and embrace this degenerate seed are actually the serpent seed. Now this can give us some deeper insight into the Middle East conflict today. It's a war between the seeds. It's a war between the Quran and God's Torah. It's a war between Satan's word and God's word. And it goes way back to the garden in the beginning. Now let's read Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. These are the words of Hashem to the serpent after he deceived Eve. Verse 15, chapter 3. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, let's think about this very carefully, because this provides insight into Satan's ultimate goal. In Genesis 3, 15, God says to the serpent, and I will put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman, meaning that there is going to be an ongoing open hostility and hatred between the seed or the children of the devil and those who are righteous and put their trust in the blood of the Lamb, meaning Yeshua, who is clearly the seed of the woman. This will set the stage for what's going to become the ongoing war between the seeds. Where Satan is forever trying to reverse the curse that God pronounced upon him in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Satan is forever trying to reverse this curse, to turn it around. But let me tell you, it will never happen. It will never, never, never happen because God's word endures forever. God's word is forever settled in heaven. Nothing can change God's word. And God's word will not go forth void, but will accomplish the purpose for which it has been sent. If you believe that, give the Lord a great big clap. <laughs> trying to reverse a curse, but let me tell you, if anyone is going to reverse a curse that Satan may try to put on us, it's going to be Almighty God, it's going to be El Shaddai, it's going to be Adonai Sabaoth, it's going to be the Lord of hosts, because God can speak confusion into the camp of the enemy, and victory into the camp of the righteous, and hallelujah, and hallelujah, and glory, hallelujah, take comfort in these words, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Amen. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now let's move on to Genesis chapter 4 and read verses 1 through 5 as we look at Cain and Abel. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, underline that. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, let's hold it up there. I pointed this out last time. These words and in the process of time give great insight. Because in the Hebrew, <coughs> 
read, reads originally, Vayahi miketz yamim, and that literally translates, and it came to pass in the end of days. So meaning, what's happening here is an insight or a picture of what's going to happen in the end of days. Here we see the concept of what is concealed for later being revealed now. Or what appears to be hidden in the beginning is revealing what will take place in the end. This is some of the hidden matter found through the Hebrew language. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Now right away here we see two different people. Cain the farmer and Abel the shepherd. Two different seeds, if you will, that were conceived from the same womb. And Cain takes a portion of his harvest and he offers the fruit of his labor, which came from the ground. You might say this represented his works. He takes it to the Lord, but the Lord did not respect Cain or his offering. However, the Lord did respect Abel and his offering. In digging a little deeper into this, according to the Torah, there are different types of offerings for different purposes. One such offering is the burnt offering in Hebrew called the Olah. Everyone say Olah. Olah. And the Olah, or the burnt offering, required the shedding of blood. It was a burnt offering. Another offering is pronounced in Hebrew, the mincha. Everyone say mincha. Mincha. But the mincha comes from the ground, meaning it's bloodless. So when Cain presents his mincha, meaning a bloodless gift to the Lord, it's easy to see why God did not respect or accept Cain's offering. Because as believers, we understand that blood is such an integral part of atonement for sin and for sacrifice. And for worship, for that matter, we enter into God's Holy of Holies, how? In the prescribed manner through the blood of Yeshua. But the flaws of Cain's offering don't end there. His bloodless gift, meaning the fruit of the ground, it was also cursed. Why, you ask? Why? Here's why. Because after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, after eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God clearly told Adam in Genesis 3:17. Cursed is the ground for your sake. So it stands to reason that if the ground was cursed because of sin, then the fruit of the ground at that time was cursed as well. So another way of putting that is that Cain brings an offering that is under the curse of sin and death, and he presents it to a holy God. It's like handing sin on a plate to God which scripturally actually is okay as long as you also present the blood of Yeshua along with it for the forgiveness of those sins. But clearly, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So Cain's works alone, meaning the fruit of his labors, cannot be accepted without blood. Paul adds in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now we also know that faith without works is dead, but initially salvation comes only through the blood of Yeshua. Somebody say, it's all about Yeshua. It's all about Yeshua. Now in digging deeper, the Hebrew text of verse 4 here in Genesis chapter 4 brings out that Abel presented both, both the Olah and the Mincha offering to the Lord. He brought two gifts to the Lord. Traditional thinking was that, no, uh, Cain brought one and Abel brought a different one. But Abel actually brought both. The writer of Hebrews confirms this in Hebrews 11 verse 4. It plainly states, that God testified of Abel's gifts, plural, not gift, as a more 
excellent sacrifice. And it actually uses the Greek word pleon, which means more than one. Abel also understood that he was in need of redemption through the blood, so he also brings a lamb with the mincha. And this is quite interesting. Again, Hebrews 11.4 actually says that Abel put his faith in the blood of that lamb. What insight. Add to this that Yeshua is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world and that Yeshua actually calls him righteous Abel in Matthew 23, verse 35. Now, I don't know if you can grasp this, but there's all kinds of connections here that is spanning over a long period of time in the spirit realm. It's almost as if that Abel and Yeshua somehow knew each other, connected through the concept of the blood of the Lamb. So Abel understood this while Cain did not. Even though they both had the same parents, they must have heard from Adam and Eve that, that amazing story of how God covered them or covered their sin, if you will, with the skin of a kosher animal which requires the shedding of blood. So Abel got it, and Cain did not. This is a key point. You either get it, or you don't. Whoever you are, wherever you are in the world, you either get it, or you don't. Without the shedding of blood, Yeshua's blood, there is no forgiveness of your sins. You will not make it into heaven on your good works only. That's as clear as it can be. Abel died, Cain did not. Because of the conflict here in the different sacrifices that were offered by Cain and by Abel, you can almost call this the first religious war in history. Now let's move on to Genesis 4 verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and killed him. It's not a coincidence that the first murder in history between Cain and Abel was actually a religious war between two brothers. Two brothers spawning from two opposing spiritual seeds actually coming from the same womb who claimed to have the same father. Now that should sound familiar to us because so do the Jewish people in the Arab nations today. They both claim Abraham as their father. And we see here in Genesis 4 the serpent's offspring, the serpent seed, Cain, rising up violently to kill Abel, Abel who was in the lineage of the seed of the woman, the good seed, from Genesis 3.15. And these are all characteristics of what will take place in the end. We're seeing it today. This is why many of the Arab nations today desperately want to wipe Israel off the face of the map because it's a war between the seeds. They want to wipe Israel off the map, but it's never going to happen. Because Hashem says as long as the sun and the moon and the stars are shining in the heavens, Israel will never cease to be a nation before me. Now this is all going to play out further at Armageddon. And I'd like to also add, in Zechariah 14, there's some serious, serious trouble coming for Israel. But all of this will play out further at Armageddon. Now the Bible does not tell us specifically how Cain killed Abel. It simply says that he slew him. And the Hebrew word harag, everyone say harag. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, it indicates that Cain struck him. Because the word harag means to smite with deadly 
intent. In the Brit Hadashah, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, which gives the accounting of Cain killing Abel, the Greek word sophazo is used and it suggests that Abel was slaughtered and then he was butchered by Cain, similar to an animal sacrifice. And I thought about that and I was reminded of what happened recently to an English soldier who was a hero, who was actually butchered to death by a radical Muslim right in public not too long ago. It's the same spirit. It's the same seed. It's the same rage. We know that radical Islamic policy specifically calls for cutting off fingers and toes and limbs and cutting off the head. Cutting off the head. This all goes back to Genesis 3.15. Now, though the Bible is vague in English in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, through the Hebrew and the Greek text, which we just looked at, it suggests that when Cain smote his brother Abel, it was with a blow to the head. Think about that. It appears that Cain intentionally crushed his brother's head. And this is extremely interesting in light again of the prophecy in Genesis 3.15, where God tells the serpent that the woman's seed is going to crush his head. And what does the serpent do? That was in Genesis 3. What does the serpent do in the very next chapter? Genesis chapter 4, he influences the firstborn of her womb, Cain, to kill her righteous seed, Abel, with a blow to the head. So this means again that from the very beginning, the serpent is trying to reverse that decision that God pronounced upon him. And if this is true, and I believe that it is, it stands to reason that this would remain to be his scheme throughout history to crush the head of the righteous in attempt to reverse that judgment of God in Genesis 3, chapter 3. Now let's take it a step further as we turn to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And this was our Torah reading for this morning from Parsha Lech Lecha. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In Genesis 22, verse 18, it reads, In your seed, Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So if our theory so far is correct, that at the very moment God blessed Abraham with the promise of a seed, and that through his righteous seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed, then the serpent would have to do something about it. Something to try and change all that because the righteous seed of Abraham was going to present a big problem for him because that would bring forth the Messiah, the Messiah who would crush his head. Now as the story continues, Abraham and Sarah waited 10 years for this promised seed to be born. But nothing happened. So as the story goes, we know Sarah tells Abraham to go into the Egyptian bondwoman Hagar and have children by her in Genesis 16, verse 1 through 3. And according to the custom of that day, a child born to Hagar would actually be considered a child born to Sarah. However, things did not go so smoothly because Hagar after becoming pregnant, despised her mistress Sarah, and vice versa, Sarah despised Hagar. 
And the animosity that followed caused Hagar to flee into the wilderness, but the Lord had her return. And in the course of time, Hagar would have a child who was to be called Ishmael. Later on, in Genesis 17, verse 20, God told Abraham that he would bless Ishmael and make him into a great nation, but that God's covenant would be with his yet born, yet unborn son, Isaac. And about one year later, Isaac, the promised seed, was born. Now let's turn to Genesis chapter 21. We're going to read verses 8 through 10. <laughs> Genesis 21, verses 8 through 10. So when the child grew and was weaned, that's a reference to Isaac, and Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, meaning Ishmael, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. Let's hold it up there for a minute. The word scoffing is important. It reads in Hebrew, mitzachek, which means on the surface, it means making sport of or making fun of, but it's synonymous with another Hebrew word, kales, which means to ridicule, to mock, or to scorn, but rabbinic commentary takes it deeper. The rabbis add that the verb mitzachek actually denotes idolatry and immorality and even murder due to its use in other places in the scriptures with other accountings. And that word mitzachek could even in its deepest translation mean fight to the death. Verse 10. So therefore she said to Abraham, meaning Sarah, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. So not only was Ishmael already harboring some serious animosity toward Isaac, meaning mocking and scorning and ridiculing him, but perhaps even plotting his death already, according to the deepest Hebrew translation. Maybe he was jealous because Isaac was the son of the covenant and Ishmael was not. But at any rate, there was enmity between these two seeds, between Ishmael and Isaac. And Paul is really in the spirit in Galatians chapter 4, verse 29, when he writes, But as he who was born according to the flesh, meaning Ishmael, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, meaning Isaac, Paul goes on to say, even so it is now. When Paul says that, he, he means that that animosity is ongoing still. Paul was really operating in the spirit of prophecy there. Now, I don't believe that Satan caused Abraham to go into Hagar in the first place in Genesis 16 or that Satan influenced Sarah to offer Hagar to Abraham. Perhaps that in itself was just a big mistake. Perhaps Abraham and Sarah, they should have waited on God's promise. It's a good word for us. Amen. Don't take things into your own hand. Just trust in the Lord and His word. That could have been a very, very big mistake on their part. But I do believe that once Ishmael was born, that the serpent went, aha. And he set a plan into motion. He took advantage of what could have been a big mistake. And that same uh, concept is for today. We have seen that recently, even in Israel. Such so as giving away land for peace. The enemy already has and will continue to take advantage of that. 
Now, according to reliable resources, the Egyptian woman Hagar is the ancestress of all the Arab nations and of the prophet Muhammad. The Bible says that Ishmael's descendants lived in a land east of Egypt as you travel north toward Syria. That land is what we now call the Arabian Peninsula. And it's from this uh, peninsula that all the Arab peoples hail from or originate from. And it's also the place where Muhammad received his revelations, which were later recorded in the Quran, Muslims' holy book. And so obviously the hostility between Isaac and Ishmael also that exists today goes back to the seeds of Isaac and of the seed of Ishmael. It's a war between the seeds. Now let's take this a step further as we look at the two seeds of Isaac and Rebekah in Genesis chapter 25. Genesis 25, beginning in verse 21. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled. Underline the word struggle. It reads in Hebrew, ratzatz. I'll come back to that. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her, her womb. And the first came out red, he was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau, which actually means hairy. Afterward his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. Underline that. So his name was called Yaakov, or Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. So Rebecca is unable to have children. Through divine intervention, she conceives. But instead of being overjoyed and happy about everything, she's troubled by what's going on inside of her. So she inquires of the Lord, and he gives her this amazing answer, really quite startling, when he tells her that two innocent, unborn children are warring with each other in the womb. So the obvious question then is, why are they struggling? Or better yet, what are they struggling about? And considering what happened later, it seems that they're already fighting over who is to be the firstborn, meaning they're already fighting for the blessing and for the birth, birthright. And furthermore, God tells Rivka, Rebecca, these two warring unborn children represent two nations who will be separated from her body and he clearly tells her they will not be able to abide together. So much for dividing up Jerusalem. <coughs> also, God says that the youngest is destined to rule over the eldest. And this already reminds us of God's choice of Abel over Cain and Isaac over Ishmael. And moreover, when God tells Rebekah that by divine appointment and authority, the youngest, meaning Jacob, shall receive the blessing reserved for the firstborn, and that the elder, meaning Esau, shall serve him. It explains why, listen carefully, explains why years later, in Genesis 27, that Rebekah is so adamant about helping Jacob to deceive Isaac and to 
obtain the blessing reserved for the firstborn, meaning making Isaac's favorite uh, food and putting hairy skins on Jacob. Because years earlier, God told her that this is the way it's going to be. So in the final analysis, Rebecca was not a deceptive woman, as many may think. She was actually a very godly woman who was obeying the prophetic word of the Lord. She was working with God's plan. And that's another good word for us today. Once you've heard from God, work with His plan, no matter what the circumstances around you may be. Notice also, in verse 27, Esau was a man of the field, while his younger twin Jacob is a mild-mannered man who dwells in tents. So Esau was a man of the field, while Jacob was a shepherd. In many ways here, the scenario of Cain and Abel is being repeated in Esau and in Jacob. Now, the scripture says in verse 26, we read it just a minute ago, that as Esau was emerging from the womb, Jacob followed him and that Jacob had his hand on Esau's heel. Now, traditionally, the name Jacob or Yaakov is understood to mean supplanter or trickster or cheater. And this could be substantiated later by the fact that, yes, it's true, Jacob deceived his father Isaac and cheated Esau out of the blessing. Furthermore, we also know that he tricked his uncle Laban in Genesis 30 in the story of the speckled flock. However, God was the one who said that Jacob was the one through whom the covenant would be confirmed. Therefore, it is wrong to say that he cheated Esau out of something that in God's eyes already belonged to Jacob in the first place. And Rebecca knew this also. So we need to challenge this notion that Jacob, or the name Yaakov, Jacob means supplanter or cheater or trickster, and take a closer look at the original Hebrew rendering of his name, Yaakov. The Bible says again, we read it, that Jacob had his hand on Esau's heel. The Hebrew word for hand, and Jim, if we can find his first PowerPoint, please. The Hebrew word for hand is Yad. I'll go to the first one. There it is. And you can see it. It's represented by the Hebrew letter Yud. As a matter of fact, the ancient Hebrew pictograph of the letter Yud, if you can see it up there on the top, is a picture of a hand. Now, the Hebrew word for a heel is Akev. And the scripture says that Jacob's hand, which is represented by the Yud, was on Esau's heel, and the word heel is pronounced Akeb, and we can find the next PowerPoint. And so he was called Yaakov in putting the two together. Therefore, the name Jacob does not mean supplanter or cheater or trickster. His name clearly means hand on the heel. Now that we've established what his name means, we must ask the question, well, why was his hand on Esau's heel? Was it an attempt to pull Esau back into the womb and so that he could supplant Esau's birthright? I don't think so. Was it because Jacob just wanted to hang on and catch a free ride out of the womb? Was Jacob playing trickster even then? I don't believe so. Because God, again, had already ordained that he would be the younger and that he would rule over his elder brother and that the blessing reserved for the firstborn would still go to him, meaning Jacob, even though he was the younger, even though he was going to come out second. In addition, 
That's not enough. History proves later on that Esau really didn't even care about the blessing. Or the birthright, because he sold it for a pot of stew. And even for a morsel of food, according to Hebrews 12, verse 16. Now here's the clincher. The word struggle that we read earlier in verse 22, when the two were struggling in the womb, it reads in Hebrew, I told you, ratzatz. And that word ratzatz is used only once in the Bible. And it means to bruise or to crush. <coughs> and that word ratzatz is also very similar to another word, ratzak, which means to murder, or in its deepest Hebrew translation, to dash into pieces. I propose to you that Jacob's hand was on his brother's heel to keep the heel of Esau from crushing his head. Confirming that the seed of the serpent is forever trying to destroy the righteous seed. Trying to reverse that decision that was pronounced upon him by Hashem in Genesis 3.15 when God said to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You may strike his heel, but he will bruise your head. Now in case any of you are thinking this is kind of far-fetched, we need to remember something. There is a spiritual war going on. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and with spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a spiritual war. And it's been going on since the very beginning. Now let me close here by adding very quickly a few other insights from the Bible. And this is brought out again in subsequent teachings on the war between the seeds. Through the prophet Obadiah, God prophesies against the descendants of Esau, saying in Obadiah chapter 1, verse 10, God says, For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. And the word violence, if you don't know it already, reads clearly in Hebrew, Hamas. In Matthew 24, verse 37, Yeshua said, As it was in the days of Noah, meaning when violence filled the earth, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. And connected with that, in Genesis 6, verse 13, when God looked upon the earth and saw that it was corrupt, he said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. And again, the word violence in the beginning in Genesis chapter 6, reads in Hebrew, Hamas. Clearly, God reveals the end from the beginning. As we all know, King Herod. Herod planned to kill the baby Yeshua after he was born in Matthew chapter 2. And Herod himself, most people don't know this, was an Idumean who were previously called Edomites, and the Edomites had a history of continual hostility and warfare with Israel. And the lineage of the Edomites traces back to Esau, clearly in Genesis 36, verse 19, if you want to look it up. So it's no coincidence that Herod, who is a descendant of Esau, tried to kill the Messiah at his birth, because if he had succeeded, then there would have been no seed of the woman no righteous seed of the woman capable of destroying the serpent. Even in the book of Revelation, in chapter 12, we see that the dragon, meaning Satan, is ready to devour the seed of the woman as soon as it was born. And in many ways, I believe that is a reference to Yeshua as you read into the text of Revelation 12, verse 4 and 5. Read it later. Revelation 12, 4 and 5. But I also believe it is a reference to the nation of Israel after it was reborn on Yom Ha'etz Ma'ut, Israeli Independence Day, May 15, 1948, which also further developed when Jerusalem was given back into Jewish hands in 1967. 
And both of these occasions, meaning in 1948 and in 1967, both of these occasions were met with an immediate attack, an immediate uprising from the Arab nations. Why? Because again, the seed of the serpent is forever trying to crush the seed of the woman. It's a war between the seeds. But hallelujah and praise the Lord, Israel is the apple of God's eyes. Somebody say amen. amen. And again, as long as the sun and the moon are shining in the heavens, Israel will never cease to be a nation before me, declares the Lord. Also, Romans 11, Paul makes it clear that God's promises to the Jewish patriarchs are irrevocable. His blessing will go forth. Satan has and will continue to try to reverse that decision pronounced upon him by Almighty God in the garden in the beginning, but he will never be able to do it. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's get animated here. He's never going to be able to do it because in the end, guess what happens? Yeshua, I said Yeshua, will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And in the end, Satan is going to be thrown into the lake of fire where he's going to be tormented forever and ever and ever. Let's begin to stand. Also, as believers, the enemy, as the good seed, the enemy will never be able to crush our heads because as believers in Yeshua, we are the good seed and greater is he who lives in us. And not only that, but we are overcomers by the blood of the land. Somebody say, I'm an overcomer. I'm overcomer. By, the blood By the blood of the land. Of the land. If God be for me, God who can be against me? Greater is he who lives in me than he that is in the world. And when the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. My God always causes me to triumph in the Messiah, Yeshua. And if you believe that, give the Lord another great day. But nonetheless, the war between the seeds goes on. And I think teachings like this are important for, for many reasons. Also because it can cause us to have deeper discernment be more effective when we pray for Israel. That war goes on and on, and it will continue until the very end. But in the very end, hallelujah, we win. Somebody say, we win. And we will live and reign with Yeshua in the kingdom of God forever and ever. Praise the Lord. Let's have the worship team come back up. And again, I want to add this originally is a 12-part series of teachings with much, much more details and insight to it. And you can obtain that in the Temple Judaica. But let's close by singing this song, Ein Komocha Elohim, number 314. Yes, 